So here we're going to talk about how you approach a GI bleed. This is an updated version of a lecture that I gave in 2013 and I updated it uh, primarily because it came to my attention that the video had lost sound. There's a few of my videos that apparently the sound is not working. I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, so I decided to update it. There's really not a whole lot of new information uh, with this update. So this is primarily just to give you a version of this this video that actually has sound. So I don't exactly know what YouTube did with my video that caused it to lose sound, uh, but uh, I figured uh, I'll try to remedy the problem here. Hopefully this one works. If you haven't had the opportunity, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can click the link below in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner and it'll link you up. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. And if you subscribe, you'll have access to some of my premium videos in which I go over case studies, formulating differential diagnosis, treatment plan, things that come in useful for you as you gear up to study for your steps. And it's also useful for real life. Okay, so some general principles of GI bleeding. Uh, bleeding can occur anywhere from the oral mucosa to the anus. Uh, when we talk about GI bleeding, typically we refer to upper GI bleeding or lower GI bleeding. But the problem is you don't really know uh, where it's coming from uh, initially. And a lot of people think, well, if it's uh, if it's bright red uh, hematemesis, it's probably upper. And if it's uh, uh, dark stools, it's probably upper. Uh, whereas if it's uh, if it's uh, maroon colored stools or bright red blood parectum, uh, that's probably lower. And for the most part, that's true. However, that rule is just a general rule of thumb. It's not always perfect. Um, technically, we diagnose, uh, or we don't diagnose, but we define upper versus lower GI bleeding being upper being anything above the ligament of trites and lower being anything uh, distal to the ligament of trites. And remember what the ligament of trites is, it's a thin muscle uh, that connects the duodeno jejunal flexure uh, and uh, some connective tissue that surrounds the uh, celiac and superior mesenteric artery. So it's really a suspensory ligament that, that holds up the, uh, the, the uh, duodeno-jejunal uh, junction, uh, so to speak. Uh, it does have a role in early embryology and uh, proper rotation of the gut. Uh, so the ligament of trites is, is our landmark, but really this is a kind of anatomic minutia because we really don't know, unless we do endoscopy, we don't really know where the bleeding is coming from. Uh, we just have to kind of make an educated clinical guess based on the presentation. So the overt presentation varies, but it is important when you approach a USMLE question that you take into consideration the presentation because uh, on USMLE questions, it will give you a hint as to whether this is upper or lower. Typically, when a patient has hematemesis, I would say in all cases, a patient with hematemesis, uh, they have an upper GI bleed. And really, that makes sense because if you're bleeding out your rectum, uh, or even if you're bleeding in the uh, the small intestine, that, that, that blood is not going to get into the stomach. It doesn't work that way. Uh, so hematemesis means upper bleed, so either in the stomach or in the esophagus. Melina is typically upper uh, GI bleeding. Uh, what happens is that that blood gets gets into the uh, the intestine and ultimately out the stool. But during that long process, the blood is oxidized, and so now it appears dark. And so these are uh, really dark uh, black colored stools. Uh, so that tends to be upper, but if there's a really slow transit time, it is possible that it could be uh, slightly distal to the ligament of trites. Maroon colored stools are typically lower uh, GI bleeding. Bright red blood per rectum is pretty much always lower uh, GI bleeding. Uh, but if you have a really fast transit time, it is possible that it could be upper, but it's almost always lower when you have bright red blood per rectum. The stool color, like I said, can't really be, uh, doesn't really tell you if it's upper or lower, but it gives you a hint. And so for clinical practice, I would say uh, you can't really uh, rely on it perfectly. For USMLE questions, though, you should know uh, what each of these mean. Hematemesis, melanoma, maroon stools, and bright red blood per rectum. 
all patients with a presentation of severe GI bleeding should immediately be treated with fluids and they should be worked up for anemia and coagulation problems. So this is like ongoing bleeding, patients that come in uh, and they have low blood pressure, uh, we consider that severe GI bleed. And so those patients need to be treated immediately with fluids. You're not going to kill someone by giving them a bolus. Uh, and remember, you need to attend to your ABCs. So when a patient is bleeding uh, really severely or they have low blood, blood pressure, you need to make sure that you attend to their volume status. All patients with a history of liver disease, alcoholism, or patients with hematemesis should also get IV octreotide. And that's sort of uh, your general care for esophageal varices, which is one of the causes of upper GI bleeding. Uh, and we do that because uh, the octreotide will, uh, will lower the portal venous pressure. And so that can help a lot of people, actually about 80% of people who have esophageal varices, that can, that can really help their, their bleeding. Now that doesn't mean that's all we're going to do, uh, but that's, that's something that you can do in an emergent circumstance to treat esophageal varices. Uh, again, with octreotide, you're, 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 it's, it's not very dangerous. Uh, the benefits far outweigh the risks when you have a patient who's got hematemesis. So if you suspect esophageal varices, and often you do when a patient who's older or has history of liver disease, alcoholism, uh, comes in uh, throwing up blood, uh, you should give IV octreotide. Like I said, the history will give significant hints to the likely diagnosis, so you want to pay attention to that. So here's some vignettes that you might see come up on the test, and, and you should uh, be able to tell me what the most likely diagnosis is. Even though you're not doing any tests on these patients, a lot of times the USMLE will ask you what's the most likely diagnosis, even though in real life you would be doing some tests to confirm that diagnosis. The USMLE wants to make sure that you, uh, that you have a number one on your differential, and that's really what this asks for. So a 27-year-old man is brought by his concerned friends in the middle of the night after his bachelor party because he was seen to be vomiting blood. Or a 57-year-old woman presents to the ED after having vomited blood this morning. She has a long-standing history of GERD, which has been refractory to therapy. She's also a 40-pack year smoker and an alcoholic. Or a 63-year-old man is brought by EMS after an episode of vomiting blood. He's had another episode since arriving at the hospital. He has a history of alcoholism. His blood pressure is 90 over 55. A 59-year-old woman presents to the ED having had an episode of bright red blood in the stool this morning. She also complains of abdominal pain, primarily lower and left-sided. She has no other contributory history. So kind of keep these in mind as we go on and talk about some of the different causes, and then we'll come back to this, and I'll show you what the most likely differential is. So the emergency treatment of GI bleed, remember resuscitation. Resuscitation is always the first step in GI bleeding. You need to triage the patient and determine, make a clinical judgment as to whether or not you need to treat them with, with fluids. And that's the first thing that you should think of. And USMLE questions could ask you, uh, what's the first step? What's the initial step in the management of this patient? Remember, anytime you hear initial step, you always need to first think ABCs. And you don't always have to give the patient fluid. You don't, I mean, not always, but uh, that's something that you need that you, you need to think of. You're not going to do an endoscopy on a patient who's got a blood pressure of 85 over 60, obviously. You're going to be attending to their, their uh, volume status first. So if you have a patient with severe GI bleeding, you give immediate normal saline bolus. And uh, what we define as severe GI bleeding is hematemesis, ongoing bleeding, so ongoing bloody diarrhea, for instance. So they came in with bloody diarrhea, and they're here, and they're still having bloody uh, stools. Or if the patient just in general has low blood pressure, or they stand up and they're dizzy, or they come in and they're dizzy, lightheaded, uh, then it, that's always considered severe as well. So hematemesis, ongoing, or low blood pressure. Uh, if the patient has hematemesis or a history of liver disease or alcoholism, as we already said, do IV octreotide, that tends to help with esophageal varices. As far as labs, you should get an EKG uh, to rule out arrhythmia or cardiac causes of hypotension. Uh, you should get a CBC because that will have your platelet count on it, and you want to 
uh, rule out low platelet count as a cause of bleeding. Uh, it'll also tell you whether or not the patient has anemia, which is important for whether or not we're going to transfuse them. You want to get a PT and PTT because uh, uh, any kind of uh, coagulation uh, disorder or uh, I mean that can be a cause of bleeding as well. And then you want to get a type and cross match just in case later on you need to transfuse so you already have their type. Uh, if they have a low hemoglobin, then you want to administer packed red blood cells. Now, what's the cutoff? Uh, I have heard through reading the literature that uh, the cutoff should be 8. However, in the past, when I was trained, um, the cutoff was 10. And the reason that the cutoff was set maybe a little bit higher uh, was because if these patients are having ongoing bleeding, that bleeding is probably going to continue for some time. And so we, rather than wait until their their uh, anemia becomes symptomatic, we'd rather just treat them now knowing that they're still going to lose some more blood. Uh, but uh, for the USMLE, if it's asking you whether or not you want to transfuse, it's typically going to give you a pretty low hemoglobin count. They're not going to give it in, in a, a controversial range, and that goes for a lot of things on the test. Uh, if they have low platelets, so less than 50, uh, then you want to transfuse them with platelets. And so you always have to consider thrombocytopenia as a possible cause of any kind of bleeding. If they have an elevated PT or PTT, then you want to administer fresh frozen plasma. So some different causes of upper GI bleeding include peptic ulcer disease. This usually presents as a gnawing, ongoing uh, epigastric pain. They may have a history of NSAID use, which uh, certainly uh, will increase your likelihood of developing an ulcer. Uh, gastritis, very similar presentation to peptic ulcer disease. Uh, typically, gastritis does not bleed as readily as an ulcer, but it can. Uh, it has a very similar presentation, gnawing pain, NSAID use, uh, alcohol or tobacco can certainly uh, raise your risk of gastritis. Really, the only way you're going to differentiate these two is going to be an endoscopy. But it's fine because the management is pretty much the same as far as how we go about diagnosing it. So when the test asks you what's the most appropriate next step, you're going to say endoscopy if you suspect one of these two. A Mallory Weiss tear is a dry heave uh, that uh, is suddenly followed by hematemesis. So typically these are patients that went on a drinking binge and now they're throwing up and they're retching and retching and retching and there's nothing left in their stomach and then all of a sudden the esophagus tears a little bit and when it tears now you have bleeding into the stomach and the contents are now bright blood and they start throwing up blood. So uh, consider uh, any patient who's got dry heaves and is throwing up and then all of a sudden boom they're throwing up bright red blood. Often this is in just generally healthy patients who just went on a drinking binge for whatever reason or has just been having ongoing vomiting that they can't control. So even like something like maybe vertigo uh, could present with a Mallory Weiss tear since they're throwing up so much. Gastroesophageal varices we already kind of alluded to. These are patients with liver disease, often due to alcoholism. Uh, gastric or esophageal cancer, look for a history of refractory GERD uh, or alcohol or tobacco use. All of those things raise your risk of esophageal cancer. And I did it. I do actually have a talk on all of these things in the GI section, so I do go into all of these in greater detail. And then esophagitis can cause upper GI bleed. Uh, that look for a history of odynophagia, so pain on swallowing. Rarely, an aortoenteric fistula can be a cause of upper GI bleed, and this you're going to have a history of aortic aneurysm surgical repair. So what happens is when you uh, repair the aortic aneurysm. Uh, you get some uh, uh, fistula formation uh, into the esophagus, and so now you have uh, bleeding into the esophagus, and this can actually be quite severe. But this is always going to be associated with a history of uh, aortic aneurysm repair. Uh, so consider that. This is pretty rare, though. So what are esophageal varices? Again, I talk about this in, in another section, so you can go back and look at that. Uh, but to put it uh, really succinctly, esophageal varices are uh, just veins in, uh, in, uh, around the GI tract that have become engorged. And so all of these veins that can form esophageal varices, a lot of them can develop around the esophagus, obviously, for varices, but some of them can develop around the stomach. 
And these are veins that uh, have become engorged because the uh, intrahepatic pressure has gone up. And typically this is due to liver damage. And so when you have liver damage, those veins become kind of sclerosed and uh, compressed. And so what that does is it transmits back pressure uh, to these smaller veins. And when the pressure goes up in those little vessels, uh, those vessels are really not designed for that level of pressure, so they, they kind of expand and, and balloon out, and uh, they are liable to burst and bleed, and that's uh, essentially what a, a ruptured esophageal varices is. Uh, when you're doing an endoscopy, you can find esophageal varices that are not ruptured. You can certainly see them. They're just really engorged veins, uh, but they are liable to bleed. Uh, so that's basically what's happening. Um, I, I liken it a lot to uh, kind of your, your portal vein and, and, uh, and splenic vein. Uh, these are like your major highways. And uh, all, all these vessels go into the liver, and uh, this is like your highway. And if this gets blocked up, well, then you're going to have to take other routes uh, around the liver. And so these are like little side roads. Well, if, if you have traffic uh, on the, the freeway, uh, and you have to go around it, well, you're going to have major traffic on the, uh, the the side roads because those side roads are not designed to take care of all that traffic. Uh, so that's kind of a, a, a way to, uh, to consider it as well. Okay. So further treatment of an upper GI bleed, anytime you have a patient with a history or suspected peptic ulcer disease or gastritis, you should consider giving them IV or PO proton pump inhibitor. Ideally, we like to give this orally, but if they're having ongoing vomiting, then uh, you'll probably have to get it, give it IV. And this can be something like omeprazole or pantoprazole, etc. Patients with refractory hematemesis, uh, you'll want to uh, go ahead with an endoscopy once you have them stabilized. An endoscopy is uh, the most accurate test for diagnosing esophageal varices. If you notice that there is esophageal varices, like a, a, a ruptured esophageal varices, then the, uh, the treatment is going to be variceal band ligation. And that's your treatment of choice if you do find an active variceal bleed. Uh, sclerotherapy is another option, but that's not your treatment of choice. Patients with hematemesis refractory to endoscopic intervention, so if you did variceal band ligation and it doesn't help, um, or they continue developing uh, bleeding varices, you can do something called TIPS, which stands for transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunting, and I'll show you a picture of what that is in a little bit. Patients who are diagnosed with esophageal varices should be on daily propranolol, and that's basically a prophylaxis for bleeding. So this is TIPS. So basically what you're doing is you're shunting between the portal vein and the hepatic vein, and this is good because what this does is it keeps you from having to go through all those little small veins uh, to get around the liver. And so that's really nice because it, it, it reduces the pressure in those veins, and that's, since that's where you get your, your varices from, uh, this will dramatically reduce your risk of, of having a, a varices, bleeding varices. Uh, so this, all this does is it bypasses the liver. It gives you a, a secondary route. Uh, the problem with this is because that blood is not going through the liver, it's not getting detoxified, and so uh, you, you can have problems uh, with, with that. Um, but typically the benefits to this outweigh the risks because obviously you can die from a massive uh, esophageal bleed. Uh, so this is a, a, a treatment, but ideally we like to do uh, endoscopic treatment uh, first because it's much faster. This is much more involved. So for lower GI bleeding, uh, we have diverticulitis, and that's often going to be described as left lower quadrant pain, often in patients with history of constipation, patients who are older, and these are just little outpouches of the bowel. Um, this is very typical in the West. If you're watching in like India or, or East Asia, uh, where the diet there is so much higher in fiber, you probably don't see diverticulitis. As a matter of fact, I had a, an attending uh, years ago who was from India, and he told me that 
he never saw diverticulitis as a medical student. Uh, it wasn't until he came to the U.S. when he started seeing diverticulitis. And so 9 out of 10 Americans are deficient in their daily fiber intake. So it makes sense that we see this a lot. And it is strongly associated with constipation in older patients. Hemorrhoids, typically going to present with anorectal pain if they're external, and also history of constipation. Constipation raises your risk of hemorrhoids. Infectious diarrhea, look for other sick contacts, food exposure, fever, usually otherwise healthy patients, uh, or maybe travel to uh, endemic regions where, uh, where the water isn't safe to drink. Inflammatory bowel disease, uh, this is going to be more chronic, ongoing uh, bleeding. Often these patients have anemia because it's so ongoing. Uh, they may have fever, other systemic signs, uh, so look for maybe things like pyoderm pyoderma gangrenosum, which we see with Crohn's. Uh, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, which we see with ulcerative colitis, uh, arthritis, weight loss, just sort of your general systemic signs. And I talk about inflammatory bowel disease in another talk, so you can go back and look at that in greater detail. Ischemic colitis would be very, very, very severe pain. We're talking like a plus 10 out of 10. A uh, history of AFib, which obviously is going to raise your risk of developing that embolus, which can then get thrown out into the systemic circulation. Uh, colon cancer, look for a change in stool caliber, chronic symptoms of anemia, and that's due to the, sort of the chronic disease process that's going on. So these patients will typically have anemia out of proportion to the amount that they're actually bleeding through the stool. Angiodysplasia, some people just have a genetic predisposition. Angiodysplasia is very difficult to diagnose because you don't, you can't really see it. Often it's in the small bowel, which you can't you, you can't see through endoscopy because remember the upper endoscopy will typically only go to the duodenum whereas the lower endoscopy will only go to the uh, the cecum and so you have the whole uh, small bowel that you can't see with endoscopy and so if you don't see anything in, on endoscopy a lot of times it's going to be angiodysplasia again these are otherwise healthy people who develop this and then into susception think of that if you have a bowel obstruction um, so um, that's another thing to think of. Uh, this, a lot of times, intussusception happens in pediatrics. So this is a, uh, should be any differential if you have a child with lower GI bleeding. And intussusception is just a telescoping of the bowel. Uh, and that can cause bleeding just due to the fact that the, the blood flow is being interrupted. And so you have uh, an, basically uh, infarction, ischemia of your, uh, of your bowel. Uh, rare causes and causes in pediatrics include Meckel's diverticulum, intussusception, which we talked about, necrotizing enterocolitis, and juvenile polyposis syndrome. Uh, I talk about this in the surgery section, so you can go back and look at that uh, when I talk about uh, uh, disorders of the GI tract and surgery. Further treatment of lower GI bleeding, when the patient is stabilized, remember it's always your first step is, is to stabilize them, endoscopy is going to be the next appropriate diagnostic step, and typically you're going to do both an upper and a lower uh, endoscopy. Uh, endoscopy is diagnostic in 85% of cases, so that's, that's why that's going to be our first step. If it's not diagnostic. A lot of times the cause is from the small bowel, and when it's small bowel, it's often angiodysplasia. So a way that we can diagnose that is by a tagged red blood cell scan. And basically what we're doing here is we're taking a, a nuclear, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, uh, red blood cells that have been uh, attached to uh, nuclear residues, so to speak, uh, if you're a chemist, you're probably going to kick me in the face for saying that. But basically, they're, they're nuclear uh, red blood cells that when uh, you administer this to them and then you take a picture of their belly, you'll be able to see it on the scan. Uh, so that's all you're doing. And uh, this will help you uh, if endoscopy is not successful in determining a diagnosis. So this should be like your second step, basically, after endoscopy. And then another uh, way that you can do this, again, to visualize a small bowel is a capsule endoscopy. And this is basically like a little pill that has a camera which wirelessly uh, connects to a computer. And so you can see the entire small bowel. Uh, but this can be really difficult. It usually requires a gastroenterologist to interpret because uh, it's very specialized.
So our vignettes, the most likely diagnosis. So the 27-year-old guy that otherwise healthy went on a bachelor party and he's uh, was found to be vomiting blood. Anytime you got an otherwise healthy person who uh, went on a drinking binge or has been uh, retching, uh, that's probably going to be a Mallory Weiss tear. Uh, again, Mallory Weiss tears can affect otherwise healthy people, uh, but they always have a history of vomiting and retching. 57-year-old woman uh, that came in with vomiting blood. She's got a history of GERD. She's a smoker. She's an alcoholic. This is probably esophageal cancer. Uh, and considering that the GERD has been refractory to therapy, she's probably got some uh, Barrett's esophagitis. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, likely uh, has transitioned into esophageal cancer. The 63-year-old guy who came in with vomiting blood, uh, and he's had another episode, history of alcoholism. This is probably ruptured esophageal varices. You can't necessarily rule out Mallory Weiss tear. In any case, we're going to be, uh, and, and then his blood pressure is 90 over 55. So what's the first step? We're going to give him fluids, and then we're going to do endoscopy, and that will help you differentiate between esophageal varices versus Mallory Weiss tear. This would certainly be someone you want to give octreotide to as well, in addition to the fluids. But first step is always going to be fluids. Then you can do octreotide, then you can do uh, your endoscopy. The 59-year-old woman who's had bright red blood in the stool, uh, this is obviously very lower GI bleeding. Is it, uh, so at that point you think is it diverticul uh, diverticulitis or is it, uh, is it um, uh, from hemorrhoids? Uh, it's probably based on the fact that she, her pain is uh, lower left-sided. Uh, this is probably diverticulitis, diverticulosis. Um, if the pain was kind of anal rectal, uh, then you would think of uh, of, of the uh, hemorrhoids. Uh, so uh, you you could just do also physical exam. Typically, hemorrhoids are pretty easy to pick up. Uh, so this is probably diverticulitis. Uh, you would do uh, imaging to nail down that diagnosis. So to recap, severe GI bleeds, which include hematemesis, ongoing bleeding, or blood pressure changes, first step is administer fluids. Patients with alcoholism, liver disease, or hematemesis, you want to suspect esophageal varices, and you should also give IV octreotide prior to commencing uh, um, endoscopy. Uh, CBC and uh, PTPTT will help you uh, dictate further resuscitative care. You should also get an EKG as part of your initial diagnostic workup. Endoscopy is the most accurate test for etiology for most, uh, most of the etiologies. Uh, so endoscopy is often going to be part of your workup. Uh, definitely, if you're suspecting varices, if, you're, if you suspect a Mallory Weiss tear, uh, you're going to do endoscopy because not only is that diagnostic, but often it, it's therapeutic as well. We can have our interventions that we do via endoscopy. For varices, as I already mentioned, octreotide is first step, then go on to endos endoscopic band ligation, and if neither of those work, then you can do TIPS. And then all patients with varices should be discharged on propranolol. Propranolol is a beta blocker, and it is basically a prophylaxis for further esophageal bleeding. And that is all I've got for you. If you have any questions, write me a note below. Hopefully the audio worked for this one. Uh, and I think I've got some other videos where the audio didn't work, so I'm going to have to go back and uh, look for those. Uh, so I will see you uh, later.